So uh, this is our panel on making sense of license compliance tools. And I'm going to ask, I'm moderating. My name is Bradley Kuhn from the Software Freedom Conservancy. So I'm going to start off and ask each panelist to introduce yourself no more than 30 seconds each, who you are, where you're affiliated with, and what your relationship is with license compliance tools. OK, so my name is Thomas Timmerger. I work for Here Technologies. Uh, we're part of the team behind Open Source Review Toolkit. I'm also involved in SPDX, and I'm also involved in Clearly Defined. Hello, I'm Valerio Cosentino, software developer at Biterchia. So Biterchia basically creates uh, development analytics for open source, and uh, so I started playing with uh, extracting licenses from code. So this is why I'm here. Hey, I'm Max Sills. Uh, I'm the head of open source attorney at Google. Uh, I manage our in and outbound compliance processes and uh, just recently joined the board of the ACT, the Linux Foundation. Uh, my name is Philippe Ombredan, and I'm uh, uh, both uh, the maintainer of a tool called ScanCode, which is a license detection tool, and several other open source uh, license compliance related tools, and the CTO of a small uh, software company called Nexby. Hey, my name is Michael, Michael Jäger. I'm, along with other people, I'm maintainer for Forsology, which is a Linux Foundation project, scanning for licenses, and SW360, which is a Eclipse Foundation project, um, uh, providing component inventory. I am employed at a German engineering company called Siemens, and in my free time, I give also trainings about tools. Okay, so let's just leave the mic at each end, and that way it'll minimize the mic passing. So our first question for the panel is, what, what GPL or other license compliance problems can, do you believe that compliance tools can solve for users? Did, did you say what GPL well, and any, other any, license any other compliance license, problems? Any, I, I didn't mean, to, you know, I'm, I'm obsessed with the GPL, so I'm going to focus yeah. on that. But any, any, <laughs> any license compliance problem. Okay. Any, what, 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 what's your laundry list of license compliance problems you believe tools can solve and how do they solve them? Actually, I, I see it today that GPL, since you have named it, is not okay. a problem for most organizations. And um, if we see it, we, we are really asking, like, what's your problem actually with the GPL? Um, we have more problems, like on our um, on on some Phosology server, on some instance maybe. Um, we have 50 packages which contain these clauses, like mm -hmm. this is proprietary information, this is confidential information, uh, this is a file where you need to have the written permission of the copyright owner, like files which slipped into open source projects, accidentally maybe, maybe some of these famous cases have been solved. But still, we have, like in the past three years, we have experienced 50 cases of mm -hmm. files which are just not for commercial use, according to their and, licenses. Well, how, and how does the tool help people actually well, comply with all this? You, you scan it, and then you find it out. That's actually part of the open source distribution, and you're probably compiling it in, in your product if you, if you didn't really uh, look for it. So, so I think that's, that's probably one of the benefits of Phosology, that it tries these licensing relevant statements which, pre, uh, which prohibit you from commercial use. Right, so it's, it's really about discovery. It's, it's helping right. people discover right. what licenses are there so they can, can read them and comply. Right. Okay, so Philippe? Yeah, to me, the, the biggest problem is that most developers don't know what third party code they use. And, and as weird as it sounds, it's a bit like if you were building a car but you forgot who you bought the engine from and where the brakes are coming from. And that's still the case. So, the value of the tools is helping you figure out where the code comes from, if it's third-party code. That's the first thing. Um, then what's the license? And they're pretty essential things to know before being able to use any bits of code, whether it's uh, uh, proprietary or free, uh, library and open source software. Whichever point of view you, you're coming from, if you don't know that, it's like, a bit crazy, but we're still very much at the basic these days. Right, so it sounds like your answer is very similar to Michael's, that it's about discovery. The tools help you discover what's there. Yeah. So, so Matt, not only, but that's the, 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 that, the essential. Okay. Max? Yeah, I'm going to channel you. Which is, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm supposed to be the impartial moderator. Okay, well, not all right. impartial, but. <laughs> which is, um, I don't think tools really do a good job of compliance. And I think there's this, this fantasy, or I guess this industry push, towards tooling, like let's just get the best tooling, let's use the best system and not worry about open source compliance um, as kind of a substitute for knowledge. 
So tooling is really great at a start, for example, like when you want to see what the license of some source code is. But it doesn't work without some knowledge of how to actually interpret the terms of the license or a thoroughly documented process for building software. How do you build the software? Where do you store the code? Do you, basic stuff like, what's the linking style of something? Um, yeah, that's all I was going to say. I think that, uh, there's, that there's that fantasy out there. Well, in my effort to be an impartial moderator, I'll push back on that a little bit. Um, I think the, your other two panelists who've already answered would say, but discovery is the first step. You've got to discover what's there first to be able to do any of the stuff you talked about. Would you agree with that or you disagree with that? Yes, discovery is definitely the first part. But I, I guess there's two, there's two camps of tooling. There's like people, so scan code is a wonderful tool. We use it extensively. Um, there's the camp of tooling that wants to use scanning and tooling as an input to a larger process. Like you've talked to people. Human beings have agreed on social behaviors around code. And then there's the camp, like the black duck people and the, like the compliance industrial complex, where it's <laughs> let's use tooling as a substitute for thought. Let's not even investigate the software that we're doing. So I, th I think the first camp, it can be very helpful, but I would agree that it is. So what, what do you think, tool, what license compliance issues do you think tooling can help with and how does it help? Okay, uh, so I'm pretty new with uh, licensing things. Mm -hmm. So um, the tool uh, uh, we have, we are working on, basically it tries to use existing tools like, mm -hmm. like scan code or uh, Nomos, and the idea is to tell a story about licenses. So mm -hmm. how this, the evolution of licenses are like related to other software development things. Like uh, maybe you move from uh, a private repository to GitHub, so then you have a, a license change there. So they start, the idea is uh, to study the evolution of licenses and see uh, what we can tell about this. So it's like uh, we are like not really focusing on extracting uh, the current status of the project, but more like analyzing and understanding why a li license can change and uh, the impact on uh, other things that are related to software development. So, so dig a little deeper on what you mean by evolution. Uh, so, so are you talking about when, pe when other people have contributed under different licenses on top of other ones, uh, that sort of thing? Like what, yeah, what else like, is in uh, there? When, when, uh, you, I mean, when you have like an update on a license, for instance, you pass from uh, GPL2, GPL3, or things mm -hmm, like that, mm -hmm. or maybe you are integrating a component from another open source project that has a, a different license. So maybe you don't discover this at the very beginning, mm -hmm. but then uh, over the time you see that uh, maybe that component changed the license and this can cause problems in your... Uh, mm -hmm. So it's m more like a tracking of like, uh, I mean, tell a story about the license you mm -hmm. are, or the licenses that are in your project. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so same question. Uh, what, what can tooling do to help understand and comply with licenses and how does it do it? So, where well, I see the tooling, so, so as software developers, we're now developing all in CI CD. We're going faster and faster and faster. And what I basically see is that compliance tooling and so is usually way behind with development tools by default. So what our focus has been, and, and one of the challenges is basically, we use package managers. All of us use package managers. In my company, we use close to 40 of them. Mm -hmm. So we have more and more releases today because, hey, we do CI CD. So everything goes faster. We have more and more package managers that are not supported by any tools. So you can't, your discovery is limited. But then also when you have all of that information that comes from all of these tools and all, all these things, you need to be able to process it. And that's where we, what we focused on is basically, okay, we discover, but also then how can you process it? But to, to add to Max's comment, we don't say we automate everything. You, I can fully believe you cannot automate compliance fully. We call our system highly automated. So what I do my best do is to basically, as Max is a lawyer and our lawyers, is to figure out how I can take Max's thought for the simple cases and write that into computable rules. But then from the other side, what you do as a developer in your source code, also like ha give you a way to indicate this is documentation, this is a source, this is examples, and then also get this also in computable form, and then make a handshake. So I can reduce the work of the leak. So basically both sides get a handshake. And we, I we generally call us having cats and dogs talk to each other, being the, the dogs usually being the developers and the cats being the lawyers, and they don't speak the same language. So my job, what I read into is making the language that they can speak so that it's easier and we can move faster. And so that the lawyers can focus on the really complicated cases which really require dedicated attention. So we take the, the, the nit and gritty work, which handwork out of the equation, and just basically say to lawyers, hey, here I have something speaker, 
I don't know. And if we can then automate it, which is usually a month long discussion, because things are complicated in law, we try to automate as best as possible to give hints. That's basically where tooling can help you of taking the, the general discussion that you have and take that out and focus on really specific edge cases. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what we're focusing on. That leads me well into my next question, which we'll start and go the other way with. So there's this old phrase in computing, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, usually say today something like faulty data set or something like that. I would argue, uh, be a little bit unimpartial here, uh, that almost every free software project out there is a poor data set for understanding its licensing. Developers, mm -hmm. as you pointed out, do not mm -hmm. do a great job at expressing their licensing intent in a way that is consumable and automatable. There are efforts out there to try to get developers to do this. Personally, I believe that's, uh, 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 as Alexis's talk years ago was, Sisyphus is happy because there's always going to be this pushing this rock up a hill and developers are not going <laughs> to want to follow any specific documentation system uh, of licensing. So given that, how can, t how can tools actually work in a real way to even do discovery, let alone anything else, if all the data is so bad that files are not properly annotated, projects are not properly annotated with licensing, how can we actually solve that problem in an automated tooling way when the data is that poor? So the um, solution we came up with is, is well, it's, it's actually, we have multiple parties from multiple backgrounds working together. So just to explain this whole panel for the people there, so there's actually a, a group of people that are working together. So how, how it works is that uh, Open Source of YouTube actually uses the scanner, scan code. So we use actually that to parse it. We can then basically, what the generate, regenerate data then, we translate this into SPDX, which is the internal standard, and then basically Michael can basically ingest it in Vasology. So the solution that we're working on is having all these various open source tools work together. Now, there's lots of companies, and this is maybe the difference for developers, companies have liabilities. So companies care about licensing and open source. You as a developer might not, but your company does. So the way how we, how we work is basically companies have these huge problems. Like I said, we're inside CICD, everything goes faster, and we have this data problem. So the solution how we came together is by all the organizations that have this problem working together, and this is why we, we found it last year, we found it clearly defined, which is basically a, a, a central repository where we can take all of this data in and have a creation platform on top and then fix it. So just you know, all of the companies pretty much that do anything serious about compliance have compliance teams that do nothing else than figuring out these licenses. They used to keep all of this data inside, and then we were like, hang on, we spoke, and like, so Jeff McGaffer and I spoke a year ago, and it's like, Hang on, why, 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 hang on, we're all doing the same work? So what you now see is that basically all these companies realize like we have no proprietary information this, we are all doing the same work. Why not collaborate? And then basically take this, fix this data again together. And that's, what, that's how we now do this. Because basically, in case you haven't noticed, open source is exploding. Um, it's coming more and more and more. We have more and more package managers. Everything has to go faster and faster. If we don't solve this, Basically, companies will might say, like, we will not use your open source project simply because your licensing is so bad that it takes me too much effort to push it through our development tool chain. I would not, even if it's a great piece of open source, we will not use it because your licensing is so muddy. So that's why now we're trying to work together. All the people on this, in this panelist, yeah, Max as well, you're also now in, in Clearly Defined, to, to basically what can we do to provide tooling and work together that we can lift the whole community to fix this. Again, we do not want to impose you how to do licensing and enforce rules to your throat. What you will see is basically us working together and we'll, see, we'll file a pull request from saying, hey, could you not please fix this? Here you have the pull request, okay. please. So let's pass it along. So, do, so it sounds like your pitch is, is that you've solved it all. There's no problem with compliance anymore. All the, uh, all the upstream, well, you, you have a plan, right? And, yep. and all, it's going to be all upstreamed. And what's the date? What's the date it's going to be done by? We already lied. So we're, okay. We're so, so his argument is it's done today. You go to clearly defined every open source project that matters. You can get all the information. Does the whole panel agree with this? No, no. <laughs> it's impossible. There are so many open source projects out there. Yeah. We, st we started working on a solution. Uh, yeah. So we, we started working okay. on a solution. So this is basically uh, OSI, Eclipse Foundation, 
Okay. Uh, dozens of companies that I want right. to so, name. So, so let's pass the mic on. Do, do you think this solution is going to work? Or, or, uh, give me the date. Mm -hmm. When do you think all upstream projects are going to have perfect licensing information such that all this tooling perfectly tells you everything? Give me the date when you think it's going to happen. But he proposed the solution. I give the date. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, do, do you agree? Well, <laughs> feel free to disagree with this solution. Let's pass along. Do, do you do you agree with this solution? I mean, and and if so, what's the date it's it, going to be done it's by? A, it's a good starting point, but uh, data is, uh, I mean, is bad. Yeah. But uh, uh, integrating uh, different tools all together and uh, try to get uh, information also from other data sources can be a solution. But uh, I would not uh, bet on the date. <laughs> so, Max, what, what do you think? Do we, do we have this no, data this is, is going to get there perfect? This is impossible. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about why that is. The input data will always be garbage for the rest of time because the law, copyright law is garbage. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, and I'll, like, I'll just say this. Who knows what a derivative... A derivative work is. Who, know, who knows unambiguously in every case whether a piece of code A is a derivative of a piece of code B? No one knows. No one knows. And no one can know. Everyone has to do their own risk analysis. And this is the human factor, which is the only thing you, I mean, tooling will help, but I think we're in this kind of obsessive compulsive phase, like you were saying a second ago, where we have these ideas to fix copyright law once and for all. If only we could have annotations in a specific metadata format at, on, on the head of every file, then derivative works wouldn't be a problem anymore. Then we'd know the copyright provenance of everything. Forget derivative works. Who can an, analyze whether something is even protected by copyright? And so we're always going to have these, or whether it's purely functional. Like that is actually still a novel area of law, still actively developing. So never. It will never happen. But we can, to, to your point earlier, if we're integrating our... Uh, our license scanning tools in, as part of the development process. That's really the important thing, is that we keep it open and we keep it tightly integrated into how people are storing source and actually developing programs. Because again, once you're... A, a lot of people don't want to get their hands dirty. A lot of attorneys don't want to get their hands dirty with, with software development. But if you're looking at it after the thing's already compiled, already been distributed to someone, it's, it's really impossible to, to figure out what's going on. What do you about you, Philippe? Do you, do, you think we can, do you think we can fix the upstream data problem, and if so, when? Actually, it's going to be fixed on uh, December 31st, 3000. Okay, great. Exactly. <laughs> right before midnight. No, no, but it's, it's, it's impossible to fix. Yet, there are things which are practically possible. And contrary to what you said, um, you can have developers participate in the process and help. Mm -hmm. So I have two practical examples. First is Linux. I've been involved with uh, some of the top level maintainers of the, the kernel for the last two plus years with others to help clarify the licensing of the kernel. And weirdly enough, or not weirdly enough, it's, a, it's an old code base. It has a lot of history, uh, probably uh, the, the largest number of contributors we've ever seen in any free uh, library open source project. When we started, there were about 80 different licenses. And just for the GPL, about 700 different ways to state this file is under the GPL. And you know, there's a limited number of words to express that, but nevertheless, you could think about every single permutation and it, it land at some point of time in the kernel code base. So what we're doing is scanning and reviewing in details. I've just finished another review of the, the latest tip of Linux 3 yesterday. Uh, every file in the kernel to decide what's the correct license, is it clear cut or not, and how can we replace any boilerplate by a, uh, an SPDX license identifier, one by one. And that's a huge amount of work. Uh, we are hoping maybe by 2019 and the current push to have maybe 60% of the files covered there. And there's still a lot of ambiguities. And really weird stuff where as time goes by, you know, companies have disappeared, uh, people have died. <coughs> and if you have ambiguities, especially in the case of Linux, where some part of the history ends up in uh, old non-Git trees and mm -hmm. was under BigKeeper, it's, it's, it's a mess. Nevertheless, you see nowadays, if you watch the LKML, the Linux kernel mailing list, developers diligently uh, providing simpler and clearer statements of the license of the code they contribute and other maintainers nagging them to do that. Uh, so I think so, we're all for So that. there is yeah. progress there. I agree with you. I think we're, and I think we're all for Eventually, expressing licenses more clearly. Yeah. But I have a follow-up question on the Linux point. So what happens when you can't represent the license of a particular set of copyrights 
with a, a simple SPDX expression. Yeah, so, so the, the problem is, it's not really about SPDX, is what if the license is ambiguous? And, and there's still a good number of files which have ambiguous licenses, mm -hmm. and uh, eventually there's, there's two ways. Either you can get back to the original contributors and trace it back unambiguously mm -hmm. and clarify the thing, or you have to get rid of the code. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I agree with that too, but w when it is uh, unambiguous, you know what the license is, but you just can't write an SPDX expression for it. What do you do? Um, I, I don't think, so, uh, w w why would not you be able to do that? Because the, the, there's an exception involved that doesn't have an XPS identifier, things like that. Yeah, well, so you can still write an SPDX uh, expression for that, and eventually if there's no official identifier at SPDX for this between code new exception, then you can ask for it to be added. And if SPDX says no, what do you do? Well, you can continue to use it as a private identifier. I okay. mean, just to give you an idea, there's about 300-ish licenses which are referenced at SPDX. Mm -hmm. Scan code detects about 1,300, mm -hmm. so about 1,000 more. Uh, uh, and doesn't mean you can just mm -hmm. trash them and ignore these licenses. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the, re that's the recommend, uh, SPDX recommends that people, if there's a missing identifier, they just make up a private space. Uh, yeah, and eventually mean. there's discussion to have a, a decentralized namespacing mm -hmm. uh, to, to address that. Now, okay. Another example, which is, um, I've taken the top thousand packages of several popular application package managers, mm -hmm. namely uh, JavaScript with NPM, RubyGems for Ruby, uh, PyPy for Python, Maven for Java, and uh, NuGet for uh, C Sharp. And I I'm computing a bunch of uh, statistics on the clarity of licensing. It's still in progress, not fully finished. Um, there's one interesting tidbit of data that came up which is, weirdly enough, the licensing of node package, that means JavaScript, which are more often smaller and more recent than others, is usually clearer. And one of the reasons I think it's clearer, it's not so much has to do because it's a mm, more recent code or smaller uh, package in general, but because there's been a significant effort of the JavaScript and node community to ensure that there's feedback provided to developers. If you submit a package to be uploaded to the NPM registry and you don't have a proper SPDX license expression attached to your package, you'll get a warning. It's not rejected, but you'll get a warning. And I, my only explanation for this uh, uh, difference between Node and other package managers is possibly based on that. So mm -hmm. I think if you provide feedback mm -hmm. and provide some information to software developers that license is missing or license is not clear, they will react. Mm -hmm. So if you go even further, eventually for the kernel, we will get check patch, which is the tool used mm -hmm. to verify each pack is correct before you submit it, uh, act as a quasi-license mm -hmm. compiler. And if you treat licensing as something which is as important mm -hmm. as uh, the code being able to run and uh, compile. So I do have a follow-up question. I want to give Michael one, one yeah. chance to answer my previous question, which is, when, when and how do you think the upstream data problem can be fixed and, and... Okay, okay, so you don't forget about the date. Actually, uh, I'm asked about dates all weekdays, so I was hoping yeah. on weekend I won't be asked <laughs> on, on dates as a project manager. But the answer is something like uh, Philippe mm -hmm. has answered. I think the question is similar to when will we all have electric cars? Mm -hmm. And the point is at no point of time because there are mm -hmm. some who adopt right. electric cars very quickly and there are some who just don't care. And I think there is some area in open source who where people are just not so very interested in, in publishing license clean, clearly defined uh, packages, and that will stay around. It will also stay around because today open source projects themselves have a lot of dependencies, mm -hmm. and if they don't update the dependencies, they hang around for five or ten years. You will find very super famous Java components with ten-year-old dependencies, and then you can ask them, or maybe you contribute something um, to update their dependencies, but unless old dependencies are out there, being used by open source software, not really being clearly defined <laughs> in terms of licensing, you will have the situation and it will be like electric cars. In 2040s, the majority of cars will be electric, but you will have combustion engines hanging around. And I think the electric cars analogy is 
very interesting because the same thing happens now in license compliance. There are different players trying to come out with their own solution, mm -hmm. right? We have the Linux initiative here. We have a reuse.software from the Free Software Foundation Europe. Or we have Phosology where, for example, my employer, one of the reasons why we invest into Phosology is because we think if a tool is freely available and at the, at the time when we have started to contribute to Phosology, there were not so many license compliance tools out there. But we thought if a tool is actually available as free software, it will help to clean up licensing and open source software. So, so that actually links to the question, follow-up question I want to have for Philippe. So let's start with you and move, no, let me start there and we'll move it along. <laughs> but it, 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 it picks up on what you were saying last, Philippe. So, so I once called uh, license, upstream license, an uh, license annotation in projects an unfunded mandate to upstream. Because from my point of view, the companies are all asking for us. They want perfect upstream annotation of all this licensing to make it easy so all your tools work well and give all this data. But upstream developers, they have other work to be doing. They're trying to make this software work. Making perfect license annotation in their, in their project is, is a big job. And often I, it sounds like the tool folks are saying, well, let's collaborate with you to get it right. How much do you think the obligation is really on the folks who want this annotation to get into these projects, do the annotation for them and offer it as patches to them and say, does this look right to you, use it, versus this collaboration idea you're talking about, which sounds, it, it, it sounds interesting, but on the other hand, it's really unfair to ask these developers to do yet another job be, when it's not what they want to do. It's really the job of the people who are all obsessed with this license compliance stuff to actually get it done. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think, um, Contributing unambiguous um, annotations is, is a good job um, for those who are actually trying to have that or want to have that. Mm -hmm. The point is that in some cases you cannot actually contribute it because you're not the copyright owner. If it's uh, ambiguous, well, you right? can propose, right? You can propose. You, you, I think yeah, this that, is what that's, you met. That's probably and if the copyright true. holder accepts it and incorporates it, then they've they've assented. Yeah, I I, I also think um, it would probably accelerate the entire thing if those people who are asking for it um, are actually contributing this cleanup work. Yeah. And I think there are maybe clearly defined also goes into this direction actually. Um, because um, for example, if clearly defined is able to um, take over analysis work from Phosology or other tools, then actually someone else can contribute that uh, to the clinic. What, what do you think about that, Philippe? Do you, do, you think that the, do you think it should be an unfunded mandate to upstream or do you think somebody has the job to come along and do this and if so, who? So, uh, I, I don't think it's either or. Um, unless you live in a parallel universe, uh, using software which, for which you don't know what license terms uh, you, you need to abide by, it's, it's just crazy. I mean, the same way, uh, I mean, I wouldn't want to use any software for which I don't know the license. Right, and that, that's, most, that's a gateway. That's a, that's a gateway thing. But most developers are going to throw the GPL in the top level directory, start making files, and all of us would consider that a fully GPL project. It's annotated enough for any developer to care about, probably for any lawyer to care about, but the compliance mm, folks I, I tend think to want better annotation, right? I, I think it's perfectly okay uh, mm. for anyone. I, I don't care about annotation per se, I, I care mm. about clarity. And mm -hmm. if the convention, and it's widely accepted the convention is, if you slap a GPL at the top uh, level of your project, your project is GPL, then that's perfectly good enough. Okay. It may not be perfect. It would be better if you were a bit more expressive, maybe state what the license of each of the files. But nevertheless, that's, that's better than anything, and, and better in many cases than nothing at all that we see in several projects. Uh, so it's not so much about slapping annotation in as much as uh, being able to discover whatever convention may be used by a project or a community. The, the thing that's terrible is when you get nothing. Right. So uh, Max, what do, you, what do you think about this issue, this, 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 an, this unfunded mandate question? Well, should, should Upstream have to maintain this? And if not, who should maintain it? Obviously, should up, maintain? Upstream shouldn't be forced to maintain it. because We're all benefiting from their software. We shouldn't be imposing. Um, sometimes extreme commercial hardship on them for something that they gave away free. Well, if you ask it this way, I would agree to it too. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think you made an important point, which is you don't, you, you want clear licenses. So I think, I, I think that, the, so, go yeah, ahead. No, no. Well, the, th the thing I was going to say was um, convention really matters here. And I think that's something that the, that the tooling people are losing, which is that it is a convention that if you put a GPL license at a root level directory, that all the other files are going to be under that license. And we've lived with that convention, and it's been 
really low friction to create and use GPL software, for example, under that convention. And I think what we don't realize we're doing is every time we do another iteration of the new obsessive compulsive behavior of, of documenting, of annotating, we're creating social precedent and we're creating commercial conventions, which if there are ever ambiguities in licenses, eventually mm -hmm. could be consulted on. So can you imagine like a project there's two projects. One is a GPL license at its root level directory. It has 10,000 files. I think now I can use that unambiguously. What about when we move to the world where every one of those 10,000 files needs to have a perfect annotation? Mm -hmm. So is the convention going to be that if one of those files is missing the annotation, then all of a sudden the software's... That's actually good, because since you're a lawyer, I'm going to ask you a legal question. I, you can't give us legal advice because you're not our lawyer. But tell me... I'll give you legal advice. Uh, well, tell, tell <laughs> Go me, ahead. Tell me, so, so the, the compliance world has been feeding me back for years that, that the file that the, th the file on the disk has special significance under copyright, that annotating the file with its license is incredibly meaningful. So can you tell me exactly what, where in the copyright statute it says that the file on the disk is the special like unit? Like each source file. What's that? You're saying each source, each source file. The, 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 yeah. where, so so I, I've been looking for years in the copyright statutes where it says file on the disk is special and that's the thing you should annotate with permissions. So, can you help me find it? No, it's, it's not there, obviously. And actually, <laughs> I mean, if you really want to freak people out, copyright licenses at least don't even need to be written, right? Like, we can really get freaky with the extent to which convention can, can start talking so, about. So, so let's take that a little bit. So, so I mean, I, I'm being a little glib there about the file Please. because the file is not where, the, where the, the copyright controls attach. How do we annotate? How do we annotate copyright in a software project? How do we figure out whose copyrights are whose and what their license? Where does the copyright attach? Where does the license attach? People have argued that C tokens, like if you tokenize the C program, the copyrights attach with each token. I, I don't think there's any legal backing for that. No, no. I think you would probably agree. So, so ha but I, I understand the problem. What, what, how do we find where to annotate? I think the appropriate thing to do is to be respectful of project maintainers. So if we, if we look at it from the viewpoint of respect, where people have taken an extreme amount of effort and put something out there for our benefit, then we should take projects as they come. Instead of dictating, I think, how they should annotate, we should say, okay, if it's clear enough that using some kind of tool we can scan it, we bear the burden, we bear the cost of, of assessing the provenance, then that's, that's probably good enough. We should probably circle around conventions that don't impose so many burdens on. So, so Michael's already accused me of, of uh, I, I want to give everybody a chance, so, so let's keep it. I, Michael's already accused me of changing the question in the middle. So, the, so just give us your general thoughts on how you feel about the issue of upstream annotation, who should do it, why, when, and how. I mean, I agree more or less with what they said. So mm -hmm. it's a convention, so agreeing on some rules. Mm -hmm. But for instance, the, oh, yeah, yeah. the, the work that uh, NPM, for instance, is doing or GitHub, so forcing, forcing or anyway, uh, putting a warning to have a license in your project mm -hmm. can help. So I think it's like uh, a mix from upstream and then al also from, uh, I mean, knowing what you are doing when you write code. Mm -hmm. So I would say that is. What about, what about you? How do you feel about the upstream annotation question? So uh, luckily in my company, I could write a policy on this. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I have the power to write a policy. And in our set, we say like, yeah, don't fix the problem on our side, just file a pull request for this mm -hmm. because for us it's basically if we don't if we patch it mm -hmm. basically so we patch it internally where we uh, so just you know we do have in our tool an ability where we can say that the convention is if it's a license file on the root it applies to all the files mm -hmm. that is possible mm -hmm. um, to basically translate convention into machine learning and so uh, we try to say like hey please upstream it because for us, it's basically, if we fix it once, it's basically fixing going forward. And sometimes it's really, really trivial things. Mm -hmm. And it's like, guys, come on. It's like, it takes you five minutes to basically to fix this. We're, we're, we're sometimes talking about, most of the time, the license is already there. But just because they didn't perfectly follow how, for instance, Maven specifies out how the license does it. Because it's, yes, it's in the Maven ref, but it's deeply buried in there. Mm -hmm. It's a five-minute fix. Like, just fix it, and it will be fixed for the whole community. Mm -hmm. Good. So I have one last question that I want to ask you, and then we're going to turn it to the audience. So, so my last question is, um, the, the biggest compliance problem I see in the world is, under copyleft licenses, the requirements for complete corresponding source code. The source code that corresponds to the binaries or otherwise minified JavaScript, you know, binary-like things. Tell me what tooling helps with that, if any, and how. 
So you want to know the corresponding source code for... Right, so you have a binary, right? I mean, this, this is the ultimate compliance problem. I have a binary that I know was built from some sources that were under a copyleft license. How do I produce the source release that goes along with it? What's, what, what, what and where is the tooling that helps with that? So are you the creator of the binary or are you the consumer? Because there's a... Either way. Here. So um, if, if you're the creator, basically what, what we're trying to do is basically give you the, the tool chain for free. And uh, what we're also working on is giving you the instructions on, hey, if you do case Axel, we basically will be publishing for, for all the various package managers how you can comply with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, like literally exact details of like, if you do this in this, in, if you're doing Maven, do this. If you do an MPN, it's that. So those details were not available beforehand. Yeah, mm -hmm. most companies have written those. And we were like, when I asked companies that were, oh, you have those, can we just open source those? Like, no, no, no. So now I basically decided with a couple of other people to, we're just gonna write them. We anyways have them, publish them as basically, this is how you can do it. And all the tools will support that. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it will require some time because some tools are a little bit more complicated to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, and then basically, for me to think, once we have open tooling, and we give you the documentation on like this is how we do it, it's basically us as who needs it or the companies that needs it is going to all the tools that are part of that stack, and basically filing pull requests and saying, hey, Webpack, uh, we would like to do this and this, are you okay with this? And basically we provide the, the tooling for that. And then, yeah, it's gonna take a while before we get to all the tools, but yeah, it, in my solution, we have to, as we are the, the ones that would like to have it, mm -hmm. we have to invest to, to fix it. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. So, so what do you think? It, it, what, are the, what are the tools out there now that help with complete corresponding source code provisioning? On I, either side, I, consumer I, or producer? I have no idea. I mean. <laughs> I, I think I agree with you, actually, so. Because <laughs> I haven't seen the tools yet. I, I, this is what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find out where they are and how to get them. So I agree, I agree with you. That's my, that would be my answer, too, if I were asked. So, so we're in agree. We're going to agree with it. Max? Uh, Mirko's up there. Hey, Mirko. So I just want to give a shout-out to the Quartermaster Project. It's a great project. It's in development. Um, I think that, yeah, it's going to be really hard. But the way to get closer to making sure that when you convey a binary, you convey the complete and corresponding source, is to make sure that whatever tooling you have is really deeply integrated into your build system. Because that way, you can create a manifest, you know exactly every source file that went to the binary, and it's gonna be very easy to convey both the tool chain. Now, as a, as a consumer of binaries, like let's say you're in a relationship with a, a company, and they give you a binary, and you're required to redistribute it. There, it's, it's gonna be impossible to comply. Because you're gonna have to do contractual negotiations, they're gonna have to give you the source or an offer, you're gonna have to pass that along. It's really, it's really difficult. But as the producer of a binary, it's not that difficult as long as the scanning is deeply integrated with the build system. And to the point, yeah, if, if you're not the producer of the binary, it's really hard. Uh, even if you take a package in a popular Linux distribution, being able to ensure that you get the exact corresponding source code is, is not a given thing. Uh, now, some tools like Quartermaster uh, can help. I, I also have a tool called Tracecode. Uh, which is uh, using strace to trace the build mm -hmm. and figure out which files may be used, but it's, it's really low-level help and it's one hundredth of the, the work that's eventually needed. Uh, to me, the simple thing to ensure you always have the corresponding source code uh, available is to always work from source. And uh, it's, it's something that's surprising. Everybody's using open source, but very often we consume package and projects as pre-compiled binaries coming from left and right, and the, the software teams, be they open source developers themselves or in commercial context, don't have the corresponding source code. Um, it's a real problem, uh, especially after the fact, getting back to the source is going to be harder and harder. Mm -hmm. uh, website disappear. There's uh, one person and one team that helps to preserve that. That's the uh, uh, software heritage project, which is trying to index and preserve all the source code. Now, that's really important, and we don't realize how important it is. I mean, there's a whole ecosystem like in Java that's been uh, used to consume only binaries. Mm -hmm. um, there's a huge amount of uh, Java code which is not available and no longer available in source code. And when it's available in source code, uh, there's no license information. 
Yeah, I'm going to agree that everything in the world should be available in source code if it's software. No, so. But so I'm with you on that. Even, even <laughs> if you don't publish it as a consumer, yeah, yeah. not taking advantage of the fact the code is available is crazy. Yeah. Uh, I agree. It's, it's just you, you're, you're giving up on the benefits. Now, getting back to the other question just before, I wanted to add something, which is if you're publishing source code, uh, supposedly under an open source license, uh, you want it to be consumed by somebody else. Otherwise, uh, there's some problem. And why, why do you publish source code in the first place? So having clear licensing is should be part of the, the, the standard practice. Uh, yeah. I, I would argue that we, sh we should not optimize for the most pedantic corporate user when we write it, for exactly. software projects. And, and to, this, to this, for instance, take uh, uh, two examples. So practice in the Linux kernel has always been to always annotate each and every file. So that's the common way for Linux. Uh, if you take another uh, ecosystem, for lack of a better word, Ruby, Ruby developers hate writing any comment in their files. So there's very few comments in general, and uh, even fewer license-related comments or annotations. So it would be yeah. crazy to force uh, the practice of C and Linux kernel developers on Ruby uh, developers. And so, you just so have to, I that, get, to, to I have do want to give Michael a chance to answer the, 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 source code, the source code provisioning question, uh, and then we're going to get some audience questions. Yeah, because also Tom wants to hold out the yeah. sign here. <laughs> okay. <Got it. laughs> Oh, um, so answering this question as the last person is probably um, redundant because I agree that as a producer you have Quartermaster there and there's a uh, tech from Software Heritage also sitting there uh, doing an interesting project in this area. When you have a binary, um, this binary analysis toolkit might be interesting. I think um, there is a new generation um, by, uh, version out of it uh, no, it's, uh, published uh, to be published soon. Binary analysis toolkit next generation, bang, so to say. So I, I think that's interesting and I think that should be more open source because the old binary analysis toolkit was open source but the database of um, fingerprints, what you find in the binary and associations with source code being published was not public. So I think that's going to be changed now, and I think that's, that's probably also an interesting tool. Um, okay. So we're going to take a few audience questions with our last 10 minutes, which means we have to share this mic, because we only have two mics in the room. So Tom is going to run the mic, and I will pass this one around to others. So, so if you say who on the panel you want to answer first, that would help. Um, <laughs> there's basically one burning question with everything I've heard now, which is like in a high potential scenario, in a big enterprise doing like Java software for, for 10 somewhat years, um, starting to care about license compliance now is like, okay, just like break down and pray to whatever deity you have because basically you're in a very bad place and you're not gonna leave it soon or like what, what do you do? Like, because yeah, that's how, everything you just told me sounds pretty bad actually. <laughs> So, so you asked what to do. So you're basically a new company, and you're you're gonna. So what I would recommend uh, for Java, uh, open source review toolkit, my own tool. We were in exactly the same place, and and, and we basically <laughs> we, we, we we looked. So so the difference is basically, uh, so from there are all the tools. Basically, you need a tool that understands package managers, um, and the trick with all the previous open source tools was like they understand basically just on file level, copyright holders and licenses, but it didn't take the package information into account. And so we basically, we really looked at all the, actually we spent two years looking at all the proprietary vendors and we know everything's out there. And they don't really work if you really look at it, if you understand. So my first question for tools was, uh, was really like, how do you get to your source code? So how do, you, how do you get what the packages are in there? The second question you also have to have, when you show me concluded licenses, how did you get to that conclusion? Those are the two questions. That, so no matter what tool you pick, those are the two questions you have to ask yourself. So I, I, let's get the, let's get the next can, question. Can I add something to this, something important? Is it Be, because I, I was expecting that he is answering with a tool, but I would answer, uh, even though maintaining tools, Situation, you need to be uh, to become aware of your situation. Like what open source software you're using, what is actually your compliance risk, what, how do you distribute software, what's your distribution model, and from then on you probably end up with ORT likely, and I think there's also Java support in Quartermaster, if I'm not mistaken. 
Um, but I think the first thing is situation. Um, also, when I talk to other companies um, who want to use Fossology, it, sometimes it just turns out it's not the right tool for them because they're in a different situation and have different compliance needs. Um, so I, uh, I, I don't know who's the best panelist to answer. I, I'm asking about MIT and BSD compliance. So SPDX uh, identifies the licenses with leaving the copyright year and copyright holder as variables. So uh, how do you, with dueling, uh, when the licenses require you to reproduce a specific copyright year and, and holder, how do your tools deal with that? And as tool makers, how would you like upstream projects to uh, make it easier for you to uh, deal with? For example, Facebook has like a fixed year. Google uses like tautological uh, copyright holders. So it says like Chromium authors. And, and then maybe Apache plus LVM addresses the GPL2 uh, compatibility in a different way. So ju just to rephrase your question is, how important is it to have all copyright statements? Like, how do you in, deal with MIT uh, to comply and, and, and BSD with MIT and BSD license? Yeah. And how important are the years in copyrights? Like, like, how, how would you like upstream projects to? Uh, what do you, would you like them to do with years and co copyright holders, so that it's easy well, to comply with? For me, writing tools that detect copyrights is I, I like them to be parsable, but I think the, mo the the bigger question is how important is it to have the exact uh, statement. I remember a discussion with a developer from uh, actually Google uh, working on the next version of operating system called Fuchsia and he was telling me that it was absolutely essential to have the all right reserved no, no, no. trailing word <laughs> from copyright statement. No, 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 no. I, I, that's a public discussion so we can show that. So I told him no, it's, it's been, it's been it's, it's, it's over since 1950, uh, but so the question is also a legal question. Go ahead. Max, Max hold on. Mary, okay. uh, no, I actually have a follow-up question to okay. the question there. Okay, Max, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> I, I would say as little as possible. Like, the Git log is a great documenter of both the contributor and the year, right? If, if there was ever any uh, infringement or litigation, people would go to that immediately. So if you can just get rid of all copyright statements and all code, I'd, I'd be happy with that. Okay. Yeah. Now, I'd, I'd also add the easiest way to comply with copyright notice requirements of uh, non copyleft licenses is treat them like copyleft licenses. Always give the source code to everyone in the world, always, and all the copyright notices will be right. Just always give everybody source. Don't write any proprietary software. It'll solve all of these problems. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my question is, where do I find or where can I get information on what tool might work for me? So, let's say I'm a company, you know, just starting out on compliance, um, and I'm wondering, you know, what tool can I use? Now, apart from me telling them these and these and these, and tool, these tools are available and this is what they can do, um, they might not believe me because, well, you're a lawyer, you don't know anything about tooling, so... Where can so, I send so, uh, them? Yeah. So I have decided um, because Max is the biggest consumer of tools on the panel and there's too many people who make tools on the panel, <laughs> I'm going to let Max answer as a consumer of tools. Okay. Um, I, I think the response is you're asking the wrong question. I was about it, to say the same. And we deal with this a lot, sometimes more than we'd wish to. But if you're looking at a situation where things seem really messy, there's been a history of bad practice, the first thing you need to do is talk to people. You need to talk to the lowest level engineers, you need to talk to their management. And before asking for tooling, you need to make sure that there's some kind of coherent process for checking code in. Is there some kind of basic IP training to the employees so they know how they can check code in? Is there code segregation? So I, I think your, your problem is purely human. And then after you solve the human problem, if you can solve it, <laughs> then, then tooling is really, it doesn't matter what you choose. Every, every, one of these tools is going to help you do what you need to do. Yeah. But you need to be solving the human problem first. Yeah. Let's and, this last and, question because we're and, all and out of time. Second last 100% right. I mean, okay. process first. Yeah. And you can choose my tools afterwards. <laughs> okay. So let's assume that we're, we work at a company that is still on the path to putting everything in open source. So you have a mix of open source licenses and binary or proprietary things. 
uh, does SPDX or a process using something like that actually grok the fact that some things in there are binary or non-open licenses? So uh, as a company that has a lot, still a lot of proprietary stuff in there, what we do is actually we make our own license identifiers for all our proprietary stuff. So we treat basically open source licenses and proprietary licenses as licenses. So the tool is just designed to handle both, and SPDX supports basically also writing your own uh, license identifiers. So what we do, for instance, it, so just you know in the SPX Center, they start with license ref. So we do license ref, proprietary, and then here. This is how we have our own identifier, and all of our packages, when they go to our customers, they will have an SPDX license identifier exactly for that, so that our customers, when they insert our packages, they see exactly the license. Another question? Okay, I have one last question, and that is, on this question of completing corresponding source, I'd like to ask the, the tools people on the panel, has, are, are you, first of all, are you aware of the reproducible builds project, one, and two, has that helped you at all in getting to completing corresponding source? Uh, yes, we're aware. Um, it, it has helped somewhat. The, the, the problem yet is the whole chain is not yet supported to do all of that. So what you want, I said, what we want is to have basically all of this tooling running at software creation, but also be able to parse when the artifact is created afterwards. So it has to do the whole tool chain. And for that, that still requires a lot of work. It's like where we now currently are at with the open, with the open tooling, is working at source code creation a lot and figuring out the discovering and, and processing of that. We're not yet there with really the end to end. We'll get there eventually. Anyone else want to comment? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think there are a couple of uh, steps before that um, which would already solve the problem of providing the con. Uh, complete corresponding source code because I think reproducible builds always producing the same binary with the same signature or uh, like hash value is, is a step beyond that. that. And I wanted also to add that I understood Miriam's question differently. Supposed uh, that you understood the process and you understood your roles. Um, I think there is a problem that we don't have a central marketing department for open source tools so far, right? So people know that there is open source, there are open source tools and license compliance, but it's, it's really difficult to understand the capabilities of the existing solutions. And there is actually an effort on GitHub, it's called uh, Sharing Creates Value, and there we would like to list all the open source tools and, and explain their capabilities and how they fit together and how they could be arranged in, in the tool chain and in, in a company or so. So I'll, I'll take my prerogative as moderator to say on the reproducible builds question, in my very biased view, because reproducible builds is a conservancy member project, but I thought this before they were a conservancy member project, it is the best thing to come along in the last 20 years with regard to the complete corresponding source code problem, in my view. Yeah. So with that, I, and I want to thank all our panelists, and many of them, uh, before you clap, I want you to know many of them submitted talks of their own and we cajoled them into being on a panel together instead of having their own talks. They were very gracious about it and I'd like you to give them a big round of applause and thank you for that.